All right. Are you kidding me? I am joined by two gentlemen, two incredibly brilliant, creative, talented gentlemen. One is Ruben de Goyado, sitting in, kind of listening. He was in on my last episode or two episodes ago, author of the great book, Throw. And Luis Alberto Urrea, the great. Can I call you Luis the Great? <laughs> Luis the one? Great, the terror of Tijuana. Right. Thanks so much for joining me today. Um, it's an honor to have you on the podcast. NPR, and I don't know if this was, oh, I don't man. think Terry Gross talked like this, but we'll use the NPR collective. They called you a literary badass. Yeah. And my goodness, is that true? Was that Terry Gross or was that maybe just NPR as a collective? No, no, it was Alan Chuse. Okay. Alan Chuse. I don't think that Terry Gross talked like that. You had the great interview with her. <laughs> the, the yeah. Great, the great Terry Gross, right? Yeah, you know, the only way we had a good interview with her, because I was really nervous, was mm. I started out before we went on air asking her if she had recovered from trying to interview Gene Simmons from KISS. <laughs> oh, that terrible man. <laughs> <laughs> was that right before you, maybe? It had been probably like a week or so before. Oh, man. Did you hear that, she said? I said, yeah, I kind of did. It was shocking. <laughs> <laughs> Your exquisite work has garnered you countless awards. New York Times Notable Book Award, a Western States Book Award, the Christopher Award, and also, of course, a Pulitzer Prize nomination. Yeah. Um, was there a moment that stands out to you where you really said, like, dang, I can do this. I can be a writer who people are going to read, who people are going to, you know, share with, each, with, with others. When, was there a moment or moments when that kind of sunk in? Uh, how much time have you got, brother? Right? I got a couple hours. Oh, you do? Okay. Well... <laughs> You know, part of the part of the thing is mo most of your viewers and listeners will know, but you know, I was born in Tijuana, and uh, we were talking before this podcast got official, right? Bit, right. <laughs> you know, and raised uh, in in the barrio in southeast San Diego, um, and I was the literary arty kid, man. I was the one that. And it was hopeless, wasn't it? I mean, you know, if you if you were raised in Southern California in those days, um, and I'm quite old, so, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there were no Mexicans. Hmm. You could take any number of English classes all the way to college and never have heard of any Latin, Latino, whatever you want to call it, Hispanic, Chicano, Mexicano, whatever, Latinx is the new thing. Mm -hmm. There was nothing. And... Uh, you know, I joke about this with students, but the only thing I ever heard of in classes was Don Quixote. <laughs> but the teachers had no idea how to say it. And they called it Don Quixote. <laughs> There's this classic book called the, Don Quixote. The burro, right, exactly. Donkey. Yeah, I uh, thought it was a donkey named Hody. Uh, I honestly uh, did. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, my, my family were quite literate. My mother was a huge reader, but obviously of American books. My dad also a huge reader of American and English books because of my mom. Um, but I was just, I was infected with, with the desire for story, you know? And to me, all art was all the same. Movie acting, mm -hmm. music, comic books, books, all of it. I was just, I wanted art all the time. And, um, you know, there came a moment when you start writing in notebooks yeah. and drawing. I wanted to be a cartoonist. I want all that stuff. And my dad didn't quite understand what it was, uh, what I was about. I think my mother had an idea. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I did that and did that and did that. And um, I, uh, I ended up being that guy in high school with the notebook. Hmm. Maybe you were too, you know, oh, yeah. we all knew those guys, those girls that had a notebook and that became my thing because I didn't have any money. I didn't have any hope. I was super nearsighted. I was terrible at sports. I couldn't do math. I was never going to have a car, um, but I had words. I had art. That was my ambiente, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up being the first one to go to college and I went as a drama major mm -hmm. oh wow that didn't go over can, well I, with my dad i can see that though i can see you being, yeah. <laughs> can you imagine me telling my dad dad i figured out what i'm gonna do 
And he was very proud I was going to college. He was like, ¿Qué, mijo? I said, well, I'm going to go be an actor, dad. <laughs> then you had the look on his face of just utter horror, smoking his pal mouths. <laughs> and he said, is there anything else you're going to study, mijo? And I said, yeah, I'm going to write poems too. <laughs> <laughs> Double you whammy. Know, yeah, he was just like, oh, my God, what have I, you know. Um, but uh, uh, I've told this story before, but I, I, I was pretty good. I was pretty good. I realized I was pretty good. It was the first mm. time I had been good at something, mm. honestly. It was art of any kind. And um, so Le Guin, Ursula K. Le Guin came oh, yeah. to my college oh, as wow. a visiting faculty member. And unfortunately, my father had been killed in Mexico, horribly. Um, and uh, I didn't know how to process this whole thing that had happened. Mm -hmm. So I wrote about it. I didn't know what else to do. I wrote about it. And my uh, writing professor took the piece I wrote to Le Guin and said, look at this guy. And uh, she said, I want to meet him. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, I was a sci-fi freak. So I was, mm. I read, you know, Earthsea trilogy. I was a Le Guin reader, right. and uh, and that's because of Juan. My brother Juan was a science fiction fan, mm -hmm. so he was sending me through my dad when my dad was alive his old paperbacks, Ray Bradbury, and, yes, you know Heinlein and all this stuff. Oh, so he took me to meet Le Guin. I'd never met anybody famous, and you know I, I, I again I apologize for repeating a story I've told, but. But they'd rented her an apartment in La Jolla. And, uh, you know, La Jolla already kind of freaky to me, mm -hmm. poor boy. And I walked up the stairs. It was dark. And I knocked on the door. And she opened the door. And she was elfin. She was very small. Had a, a kind of a bowl haircut. A about, how, about how old was she then? She was, she was ancient, I thought. But she was probably in her 40s. Right. You, know? Was, okay, right. <laughs> you know, she was a, a grown woman. An adult, yeah, yeah. some yeah. other universe to me. Exactly, exactly. I was 19, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, and she she had a highball, right? I didn't know what it was, but it was clearly some kind of whiskey. <laughs> and she had a pipe. She smoked a briar pipe in those days. And she flung open the door, I was puffing away. And she said, oh, Luisito. <laughs> I thought, <laughs> what's happening man uh, what is this come in come in and i remember thinking this is the coolest person i've ever seen in my whole life hmm. right? and she sat in her chair and she sat sideways with her knees up i was puffing and drinking and she said tell me about your father so i told her the story and she had this will show you how old it was the mimeograph master of my story and she said, I really, I, I like this story. I said, well, thank you. She said, you must be in my workshop. Mm. I was like, what? <laughs> she said, I want you to take my workshop. And I thought, holy God. Okay, yes, of course. And she said, and um, I would like to buy this, please. Whoa. And I said, I said, buy it. You've already got it. Uh -huh. Yeah, what does that even mean, right? You know, right. I didn't know. I was ignorant. <laughs> She said, no, 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 no. I'm editing an anthology. I would like to publish it. So you'd like to buy it. Wow. So life changed. I didn't even know life changed completely mm -hmm. in that moment. Mm -hmm. You don't always know, right? When, yeah. when uh, fate takes a turn. And then she just took me under her wing. She was, she was, she called herself my tia Osita. Mm. My little, my little bear aunt. Yeah, yeah. And she kicked my ass around, man, because she was, she was, she was, she was not shy about her opinions or about, you know, setting you right. Yeah. But that was, that was, that was truly my education, more than yeah. college, it's Ur Ursula's wow. tutelage. As you can see, I have a, uh, some motion sensor here, so I'm trying to keep the lights on if I can. <laughs> um, so I was like, just know, wave your arm while we're talking. I, I get, I should, right? <laughs> yeah. So you know, Magic Johnson in his rookie year won the NBA Finals MVP, and he won the NBA Finals. I don't know. That, that's a pretty good analogy, huh? You can't, so your first story, one of your first published story, your first published story was handpicked, was curated by Ursula Le Guin. 
Yeah. Not bad. It was not, not bad. bad. Wow. Not bad. And I've got to tell you, one of my favorite moments, because, you know, I was a working class kid. I'd left the barrio. I was living in a suburb of San Diego called Claremont. Went to Claremont High. Yeah. Later made famous by Fast Times at Ridgemont High. That was oh, the yeah. actual high school. Uh-huh. Um, and, uh, you know, I had all my friends, all my dudes. And they were all guitar players and mm. actors and, you know, just a little cabal of art freaks. Sure. And uh, we hung out in a donut shop, Winchell's Donuts. We called it Winks because it was open all night. And we'd sit oh, yeah. there all night long writing songs, debating. They would chain smoking, eating, you know. And uh, so we were in there, a bunch of us. And one of the dudes came in and said, dudes, I just saw the dudes book at Warwick's books on the shelf. We we're like, no way. He said, yeah, man let's all go see it <laughs> six of us get in the van drive down to the mall go in the bookstore and there's the book wow it was called edges mm -hmm. one of those little pocket sure paperbacks right you know pocket books with the kangaroo on it it's like a buck 25 for the book uh-huh and so the guy basically says dudes we must all buy his book <laughs> obviously and they all bought one nice and so we we go to the cash register and they say, dude, you've totally got to sign the book, man. And I thought, holy crap. So, you know, I tell students this all the time, but one by one, they would buy the book and then turn around and <laughs> give me the book and I'd sign it. <laughs> and by about the fourth book, I thought, uh, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And as I was signing the last book, a woman a grown up tapped me on the shoulder, swear to you, and said, Excuse me, are you somebody? That's the moment. Because I, I said to her, Well, yes, I am. Ooh. That was the moment. You asked about about two hours ago as we started talking. <laughs> but that's how that's when I knew. I thought, you know, Le Guin was one thing, but people, I I I have been blessed with grace a lot. So people have often been very kind to me for no reason I can discern. But when that happened, a complete stranger, clearly out of my orbit, you know, a, a grown up white lady, somebody's mom tapping you on the shoulder where you're all these scruffy, you know, hard rock guitar players and stuff says, uh, are you somebody? Yes, I am. That's what did it. That's what made me think, mm -hmm. wow, I think I can do this. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go back a little bit if I can. Um, tell me about the Odyssey in Espanol. Is that the, <laughs> that the, that the book? I that should you have brought it. I've got it upstairs, man. Yeah. Um, the Odyssey. <laughs> well, when we were still down in Logan Heights, there was it was culture war. My parents detested each other. Mm. Part, you know, largely because of my dad's shenanigans, let's face it. But, um, and I've said this before, I'm sure you've heard me say it, that the kitchen was the U.S. and mm. the living room was Mexico, but it was mm. true. In the kitchen, we spoke English. In the living room, puro español. Mm. My mother called me Luis because right. she never spoke Spanish. My dad, you know, Luis or cabron. <laughs> <laughs> Either one. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and she was winning because she was she was exposing me to Dickens and Mark Twain and uh, Rudyard Kipling. And I was just, mm -hmm. and my dad, I, you know, I think he saw himself losing the culture war because we were in San Diego. Everything was in English. Mm -hmm. This horror of the Beatles had appeared. Uh oh, It was a nightmare to him, Los Beatles. Um, you know, I watched American TV and he tried. He'd get me to watch Tijuana TV so we could watch bullfights or mm. El Box, you know. Uh -huh. um, so he was losing the war and he knew I liked to read. So he set out to try to find, uh, you know, reading material in Tijuana. And he hated comic books. So he would never deign to get me a mm. Caliman Mexican comic, you know, but he was trying to find books in Spanish. So he finally found books and he came home and my father was given to these very dramatic Mexican gestures, muy Mexicano, muy, muy hombre. 
and you know he came in with his eternal cigarette and he <laughs> slammed the book on the table i said mijo and he pointed to it so i looked at the book and it was the iliad and the odyssey yeah. by homero oh, translated man. into spanish uh -huh. in, a, in a spain spanish edition and my dad says to me study it in its original spanish oh i love it <laughs> Oh, you know? and i thought this is this is even as a little kid i thought this is really sweet right oh you yeah know? what a sweet gesture some what 800 pagina something like that but you had to oh, read yeah. them, right oh my oh, god yeah yeah oh, my god. And he i was i was a real i mean i loved uh myth stuff mm. you know i loved that stuff and i did have some you know kid versions of ulysses and sure. he, you know i also loved ray harryhausen movies and i was always watching like Jason okay. and the Argonauts and stuff like that. So my dad just thought, this is it. This is a perfect thing. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a span, clearly a Spanish story. <laughs> right. Right. I, I, you know, I think sometimes maybe it's too simple of an explanation. People say like, Oh, you know, writing about such and such was cathartic. And obviously with the, the tragedy of your, of your father's death, um, was it cathartic? Was it, was it and was it a hundred percent painful? You know, like the piece that you wrote, like for for Ursula. You know, did it did it help, or was it just something like you had to do? I had to do it. I had to do it because um, it was so odd. I mean, he 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 was driving back from Sinaloa. He had gone over Christmas vacation to, you know, get money out of the bank. You know. It's, a, it's an old tradition. You send remittance money back to the homeland. Mm -hmm. But he was putting money away because in, I think in his dreams, he was going to leave California and go back to Sinaloa. Okay. That's what he wanted more than anything to, mm -hmm. to, to live out his years and to die in Rosario. Mm -hmm. You know, Rosario is like our personal Macondo in our family. Okay, it's yeah. magic yeah. land, you know. Right, right. And uh, he was bringing back a graduation gift for me because I was the first to go to college. Wow. And he was caught by cops south of Yuma in San Luis, Rio Colorado, and he died badly. And um, they never found the money in his pockets because he had urinated and bled on them and they wouldn't put their hands in the pockets. It was a terrible, anyway, so we, we had a, he's still alive but he's quite ill now but a cousin ugo and ugo was the family pistolero you know mm -hmm. that one really tough guy everybody was terrified of him and he had partially raised me in the in the absence of brothers mm -hmm. um and he drove from tijuana all the way to that town 300 miles or something and he was the one who held my father as my father died and he had the money he brought back and gave to me mm -hmm. at the funeral home. And the cops brought the body and then made me buy it. So they got their money. Yeah. Um, and there was this strange moment. This is all to explain that story to you. But there was a, a, a strange moment when we were all, um, you know, sitting with the body in shifts. And Ugo took me to the uh, funeral home about two in the morning in Tijuana and left me. And it was just my dad and me in this room. And they were supposed to come in about an hour, but nobody did. So I spent the whole rest of the night into the funeral time just with the dead body of my dad. Um, and he was in a coffin and it was sealed with glass because they don't embalm people mm -hmm. and he was messed up my father never was messed up a day in his life he'd never worn jeans or shorts always pressed slacks and he was very serious about these things um and so i would unscrew the lid and lift it up and and stare at his face which was broken but it was my dad now la gloriosa i meant mentioned to you from before we started from uh, house of broken angels mm -hmm. that was gloria from the family, extended family, and she had been out dancing and came into the funeral parlor at about three in the morning. And it was this exquisite, unbelievably surreal moment with her that 
She's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'll leave. I don't want to cause a scandal. I said, what are you talking about? He loved you. Mm. So we unscrewed the lid and she sort of laid her head on the glass. And it was just odd, you know, just. Yeah. So I got home and really weird things had happened. I, I'd forgotten how to speak English. Mm. It was mm. really strange. And when I did speak English, it was like with this Tijuana accent I used to have. People thought I was kidding. And my best friend came over and he, he laughed his ass off until he realized I was crazy. I was broken. Yes. And um, so then I, I had this weird sort of visionary series of dreams. In some ways, I think it was a training ground for Hummingbird's daughter much mm. later. But, uh, you know, he came, he came and we talked it out. And in the dreams, I, I knew I had to tell him he was dead. He didn't know he was dead. And I, I remember thinking, if I don't tell him, I can still have him here. He won't know any better. Yeah. So I had to tell him to leave and he was very upset. And then, you know, there was a, a final dream in which he came for me in the car his old car and he took me to Rosario Sinaloa. Wow. It was like this weird spirit drive. And I remember in the story, I, I even have this quote that um, he was, he was very cryptic in a lot of ways. My dad had a lot of style, you know, and uh, he wasn't religious. He didn't like religion much, but he was very spiritually oriented in his own way. And as we're driving, I asked him, dad, did you see God? And in the dream, he just looked at me and smiled and turned on the radio and kept driving. And I thought that this is my dad, such an elegant gesture. So when I when I wanted to write about it, I didn't know how. And and I was scattered and, and cracked in my own thinking. Sure. And so I accidentally wrote it in these chunks separated by slashes, and it ended up looking like the reflections of all the broken glass in the car that the cops forced him to crash in. Mm -hmm. So Le Guin was just, you know, this was like metafiction, you yeah, know? Yeah, yes. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was for survival mostly. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't imagine publishing it. I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just took it to my professor and said, look, look. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you talk about all, a lot of the grace you've received in your life. Obviously, you've you've given a lot. I mean, uh, yeah. obviously, you're incredible with the craft, but the the way that you interpret for people, the way that you kind of take the spiritual world and bring that emotion, you know, while we, we may not have had a big angel, we we know similar things. We know similar people. Yeah, of course. You're, you're, you're incredible at being able to interpret or, 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 or translate that or, or bring that. Um, so... You have you have spread a lot of chills throughout your own writing. That's that's incredible. Who were some of those writers? You talked a little bit about it. Who are some of those writers for you who brought you chills at will? The name of the podcast. Who who made you go wow? So Give many, me, right? <laughs> yeah. So many. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, let's go right right to the very beginning. Um, you know, my mother to win the culture war, like I told you. She would read me Dickens. That was the first. And I had no idea what she was saying. I didn't understand the language or the, you know, and my mom also couldn't help herself. And she'd sort of develop sort of a British accent. Which yeah. And I remember lying in bed and it was in great, great school, like third grade, fourth grade. I mean, um, and I didn't completely understand, but I would fall asleep and I still see it in my mind seeing waves of the ocean made of words hmm yeah that was pretty cool right uh and then she busted out tom sawyer uh -oh. blew my mind i you know for so many reasons i i thought this is some hundred and fifty thousand year old dead dude from some place i'd never heard of and you know you're from tijuana and southeast san diego you've never seen a river, <laughs> you know, the San Diego River is what anybody else would call a stream or a creek. Sure, the sure. Tijuana River is a, you know, a, a concrete thing with effluent in it. And, mm. and the Mississippi River was 
as exotic as the Amazon. Right. And, and that that story was so alive and astounding and funny. And, and then when she brought the Jungle Books, you know, and it kicked off with my imagination, I was Mowgli. Mm -hmm. And so those, you know, because things were so miserable in the apartment complex we lived in, and, you know, it was a lot of race tension. It was white versus brown versus black in that neighborhood, mm -hmm. in every combination you could imagine. So of those three. Sure. Um, you know, I, I escaped into those books. So those were the beginnings. And, you know, Juan bringing me his sci-fi books. Mm -hmm. He was a, a, a fanatic for E.E. E. Doc Smith. Okay. The okay. Skylark series mm -hmm. of, you know, space opera, okay. space yeah. wars. Uh, and those were cool. But when he gave me a Ray Bradbury book, yeah. I think I think I may have levitated because hmm. I had never read anything like Ray Bradbury. And uh, boy, man, that was just, that was overwhelming to me. Um, and, uh, you know, on down the road, I was just a reading maniac. I, I loved Edgar Allan Poe when I discovered him, but I loved Ambrose Bierce even more because okay. he was sick, wild, uh, crazy uh, man, you know? Sure, sure. Uh, I thought, what is this? I, uh, I remember finding the Hell's Angels by Hunter S. Thompson in paperback. My mother was so pissed, but I thought this is, ast I'd never thought of nonfiction before. Mm -hmm. It was astounding. Mm -hmm. I thought, what is this? This is incredible. Yeah. Um, and I can go right down the line, you know, Edward Abbey, mm -hmm. Annie Dillard. Yes. Uh, Stephen Crane. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jack Kerouac. Charles Bukowski, Thomas McGuane, you know, Robert B. Parker, mm -hmm. <laughs> James Lee Burke. It never ends. I mean, Jane Hirschfield. Mm -hmm. And then I found the Japanese poets, you know, haiku poets, Basho, Isa, Busson. You know, it's it's been, it has been a river. Right, right. It's right, never right. stopped. You referenced Charles Bukowski, San, San Pedro's favorite son. I, I lived in San Pedro <laughs> yeah. for a while. I got to, I actually met um, Ray Bradbury probably 2009, 2010. Oh, his, wow. Right before he passed away. I met him at the, at the famous Williams Bookstore, which was around in San Pedro there south of L.A. Wow. And, and I, I can't say that I'm a huge sci-fi sci fan, but, you know, Ray Bradbury is Ray Bradbury. And I taught some of his stuff, and it was pretty amazing. I think it was... My time's getting a little confused, but I think it was about a year before he died. So it's pretty incredible. Wow. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yes. No doubt about it. Um, well, there's so many, you know, and, and I, I tell my writing students this, that what you've got to understand about this is that you one day realize that these people that you love so much, at least in the abstract, mm -hmm. accept you into their club. Yes. yes. And you suddenly know them, you know, at one point I, I got a little teaching gig in Lafayette, Louisiana, after I got, you know, I'd been in, in Tucson working on Hummingbird's Daughter and uh, Ernest Gaines mm. had gotten his genius grant and gone off to France and they needed somebody to fill in the hole and friends of mine were, so I came and we moved into the neighborhood where he lived. And Mr. Gaines was our neighbor when he came back. Wow. You had wow. walked down the block and there's Ernest Gaines, for God's sake. You know, things like that change your life every time. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I, I, um, I'm so interested in the way, you know, you are so generous. I, I, you know, see on social media and, you know, blurbing books and being on this, being on that, helping others out. You have your operation uplift you know on, on facebook and all that all oh, you've seen that oh yeah day day number you know 235 or whatever um how did you feel have you always feel like you've been welcomed in the community of writers is this is it kind of a pay it forward type of thing i mean from the beginning with ursula it sounds like you were i guess i guess kind of how do you see that responsibility to to share to to include you you have to you have to um aside from from the Ursula experience, mm -hmm. you know, I was, uh, you know, I came out of the Mexican American writing world, mm -hmm. the Chicano literature world. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And uh, frankly, they those guys weren't that they weren't that warm at the beginning. You know, I was in San Diego, and it, and in those days, I don't think it's as doctrinaire now. Mm-hmm. But in those days, you know, the Marxist dialectic was strong. Okay. And the purity of being a Chicano dictated by definition that you were a Mexican born in the United States. Right. I wasn't. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so they would call me Tijuanero. Oh, yeah, it's el Tijuanero. Which was kind of rough for me because I thought I'm catching flack from all the white boys for being from Tijuana. Now you're going to do it too. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I, I think that was, that was, it was hard for me um, on a certain level, but I think it was, it was a formative thing because mm-hmm. you, you, you feel like you're a man with no country. Mm-hmm. Your country is actually your art. That's mm-hmm. where I, I still feel that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I got to know the poet Aludista. You know, okay, who was, okay. uh, I, I, I grew to love Aludista. It partially, and I tell him this, you, you're the only poet with a bullfighter's name. Hmm. You know, his name was Alberto Urista, but he made one word out of it. Shoot, out, of head, Urista, out of a heading book or something, right? Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, it, it, he had published some of my work without meeting. And hmm. they had decided to have a reading in Tijuana, a Spanish reading of poetry. And so I went. And when I got there, people kind of shunned me like, and even he, he'd walk by and look at me sort of askance, you know, Mm -hmm. and then I got up on stage and read in Spanish and you could see them go, oh, oh. And I remember he came up to me, he said, I I imagine you're actually that guy. I said, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. But we became pals. And, uh, you know, um, I, I, um, when I got out of college, I uh, I started my, my other life. And this may explain a lot to you. Part of the time, I was doing relief work in Tijuana with the poor, Mm -hmm. with a missionary group, as a translator. And when I wasn't doing that, I was working as a bilingual TA at a Chicano Studies Department. Oh, nice. San Diego Mesa College, Mm -hmm. under a great man, Cesar Gonzalez. And uh, Cesar was very connected to the Chicano movement and the writers. And through Cesar, I became friends with Rudolfo Anaya. And once I became friends with Rudolfo Anaya, you know, it just, I met and met and met and Mm -hmm. met people. Mm -hmm. And that community, it was very nurturing. Once you were there, you know, we were, we were a lot of competition and all that, you know, it's like siblings anywhere, but uh, we all had a real, a real sense, I think, of the duty of someone who can help. And because all of my, I consider that phase right after college, my actual training period, Mm -hmm. all of my energy and effort and thought when it wasn't focusing on trying to create my work Mm -hmm. and, you know, romance, (laughs) those things aside, everything about my life was trying to 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 step up to being a servant if that makes mm-hmm. any sense to yeah you. it does it, it was all about service mm-hmm. you know you you're going in the daytime and you're you know you're 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 feeding the hungry you're you're looking at wounded people you're burying the dead you're you know lice in on your arm hairs it's it's a world that none of my friends in San Diego could possibly comprehend. Mm-hmm. I, I and love. Then, sorry, oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say I love the character of. Uh, he's called it a couple of different things, but like what coffee, coffee philosopher Dave, or some of that effect, ends up being the Jesuit priest, right? Yes. Um, you know, I come from a Jesuit from Jesuit education, and there you do. I do Jesuit high I, school in Sacramento, Santa Clara. I love University. you guys. Oh, I mean. They're, they're thinkers, they're, they're scholars, they've been around the world, they speak multiple languages, you know. Um, so I wonder- Well, if it, you might- Go ahead. I was gonna say, you might appreciate this. Mm. So the guy I was working in Tijuana with mm-hmm. was a Baptist preacher. Okay. But Cesar okay. Gonzalez is a Jesuit. Uh-huh. He had been in training to be a priest. Yeah. 
And I was much more leaning, you know, I was no Baptist brother, <laughs> but, you know, it was very much leaning toward being a, a Jesuit. When I was a kid, it was Catholic school, went to mass every morning. Oh, yeah, that's right. 